the wisdom. Praise the Lord. By the time we get through, y'all are going to be so wise. and Amen. Me too. I'm learning too as I go. Okay. Uh, Proverbs 22. Basically, this chapter deals with credibility and the way to have good credibility. Okay. It's important to have good credibility. Uh, so I'll read one verse and let you sit down. Verse 1, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come before you right now and we ask your blessing to be upon the reading of your holy word. We give you all the glory and honor and praise, God. Give us inspiration tonight to preach it, God, and to hear it and receive it. In Jesus' name, thank you for it. Amen and amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. All right, go to Acts chapter 11 and verse 26 in the New Testament. The importance of having a good name, credibility in a good name. Now, a good name, brothers and sisters, is not automatic. Okay? It doesn't just happen. It doesn't just, just automatic. It takes a period of time, really, to establish a good name. So, don't destroy a good name. Amen. After you've built it up. So I read a story about a man who saw a young boy ask him what his name was. And he said his name was George Washington. George Washington, said the man. The boy said, yeah, George Washington. He said, the man said, that is a great name. It's going to be hard to live up to that name, isn't it? And the little boy says, no. And the man said, why, why do you think it's not going to be hard for you to live up to such a great name as George Washington? He said, because I is George Washington. <laughs> I don't think you understood, you know. That George Washington was a great president, right? Amen. So I guess he felt like he already lived up to his great name, you know. Amen. But that's right. It takes a long time to build up a good name. And so uh, it's important. It's, as the Bible says, it's rather to be chosen than great riches. It's important, amen, that we live right so that we'll have a great name. But in the Word of God, in the book of Acts, in the 11th chapter and verse 26, this is one example of what we're called as believers in Christ. We're known as Christians, amen. Now that's a great name. When they first used it, it was a, a name to sort of mock the believers. You know, the people of the way was what they were known. The people of the way, Christians. And uh, so they used that term to mock the Christians, to put them down, you know. Uh, but it became a name that was an honored name later. Peter, later on in his epistles, talks about being a Christian. So Peter picked it up, even though it began as sort of a slur, he picked it up and it made an honorable thing to be called a Christian. So in Acts 11.26, And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that the whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Say Christians. Now, <clears throat> Christians, uh, they're first called Christians in Antioch. That means the Greeks looked at these people, the people of the way, and said, these people are Christians. Well, what made them say that they're Christians? Well, they thought the name of Jesus was Christ. You know, that his name was Jesus and his name was Christ. So when they saw these people serving the Lord and following Jesus Christ, they said, well, they must be Christianos. That's the Greek word, Christianos. And what they did is they took the word Christ, name, Christ, and they added Ianos to it. And Ianos in the Greek means a slave. So they said, basically, when they saw believers in the New Testament church, they said, these are Christ servants or Christ slaves. So they, as I said, started out as a term of derision. They just, they're slaves, you know, of the Christ. But later on, it became a term of endurance. Well, we know what Christ means. It's not a name, it's a title of Jesus. Christ means anointed one. 
So not only we're the slaves of Jesus Christ, but we are the anointed ones of Christ. Amen. Just like Jesus was anointed, we're anointed by the Holy Ghost in power. So it is important if we claim to be Christians that we live like we are a Christian. Amen. The Bible calls us saints. Let's live up to that name. Amen. The Bible calls us brethren. So let's live up to that great name by which we are called. Ultimately, we're called by the name of Jesus Christ, the name which is above every name. And what an honor it is to be called by the name of Jesus. So let's live in such a way to maintain that good name that we have. Amen. Praise the Lord. And the way you do that is by the way you live. Not by what you say. It's by the way you live. So you have a good name at work, good name at the church, good name among your family members. Hallelujah. How many of y'all have family members they don't have a very good name? Now, don't lift your hand, but I mean, I'm talking about way back in the genealogical record, you know. Amen. I don't even bother with that. I don't go and do research and try to find out who my ancestors are. I would, I would be afraid, I think, if I found out, <laughs> you know, who they were. I don't really want to know who they were, you know what I'm saying? Praise the Lord. But I want to have a good name, so let's live like... We're trying to live up to the good name that Jesus has given us. Amen. It's more important than having riches and gold. Verse 2. The rich and the poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. Now, one way to look at that verse is that God is no respecter of persons. So whether you're rich or you're poor, God made everybody. And He is no respecter of persons. God doesn't look at the rich and show them partiality or favoritism. Nor does He look at the poor and show them favoritism or partiality. Amen. I think He has compassion on the poor. Uh, the poor need compassion. But I think the rich, you know, they need some other things. If the poor need compassion, the, the rich need to learn how to maintain themselves. You know what I mean? So when we look at this, the Lord is no respecter of persons. Now, I think when we look in the Word of God, the Bible says that He makes the rich and the poor come together. Let's go over to the book of Genesis in chapter 30. And we'll give you an example here of a rich man named Laban and a poor man named Jacob. And we're in 3027. So whenever you look at it, God brings the rich and the poor together, there's a reason for that. So the poor man can learn something from the rich man. The rich man can learn something from the poor man. Okay? Now, in 30 and 27, this is Laban. We would consider him the rich man in the passage. The Bible says, And Laban said unto him, I pray thee, if I have found favor in thine eyes, tarry, for I have learned, look at this, I have learned by experience that the Lord hath blessed me for thy sake. So what did Jacob do? Jacob taught Laban some things about God. Well, what did Laban teach Jacob? Verse 7 of chapter 31. This is what Jacob learned about a rich man. Sometimes can happen. <clears throat> Okay, let's just go up here and we will look at verse 5. 4. Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field unto his flock and said unto them, I see your father's countenance that is not toward me as before, but the God of my father hath been with me. And you know that with all my power I have served your father, and your father hath deceived me and changed my wages ten times but God suffered him not to hurt me. So Laban learned about God from Jacob, and then Jacob learned about man when he looked at Laban. What did he learn about man when he looked at Laban, the rich man? Don't trust them. They can deceive you. And they at times are deceptive. Okay, amen? But ultimately, what did Jacob learn about God? Look at verse 5 of the same chapter, 31.5 as the poor man here. He said, I said unto them, I see your father's countenance that is not toward me as before, but the God of my father hath been with me. See, that's sometimes the things that the poor man know 
that could teach the, the rich man is that God is his provider, his protector, that the presence of the Lord is with him, you know. Sometimes the rich man just goes through life and he thinks he's a self-made man, so he doesn't acknowledge God, that God is his provider, protector, and the presence of the Lord is there. But you see Jacob in the passage, as the poor man recognized that it was that God was the one that blessed him, provided for him, protected him, the presence of God was with him. Laban, even though Jacob was there, never really got it. Jacob was trying to show him the ways of God, and he acknowledged it from time to time, but Laban really never ever changed, brothers and sisters. He was that rich man that God put the poor man in his path to teach him the ways of God, but he just never did really get it. He acknowledged it from time to time, but he didn't get it. So it didn't work out like ultimately it should have, but at least he was impacted somewhat. Amen. Okay? So verse 2 of chapter 22 of Proverbs, the rich and the poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. So God is the one at times that will bring by His sovereignty people will meet each other in life. And there's a reason. Amen. Verse 3. A prudent man foreseeth evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. This teaches us to avoid problems. Man, you look at life, you see something down the road that's going to come, it's going to be something that's going to be hard. Avoid it. Don't just keep on going and keep on going until everything breaks. You see something, a trouble coming or whatever, make some preparations. Now God gives us some prophecy. He tells us about things that are going to take place in the end times. Go over to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21. Luke 21, Jesus gave some prophecies in verse 19 to his generation. He told that generation that there would be armies that would come and encompass Israel, Jerusalem, surround them, okay? And uh, let's see what, first of all, the prophecy is in Luke 21, 19. In your patience possess ye your souls. Now the word patience means endurance. So you're going to have to endure very hard times. I told, talked to you about that Sunday, about sometimes there are going to be stretches in your life that are very, very difficult. In the book of Hebrews chapter 11, we talked about people that went through great, great trials and tortures and all kinds of things, uh, serving God, and they were in faith. So you're going to go, as you live life, you're going to go through stretches of really hard times, even as believers. So you have to have patience. You have to have, patience doesn't mean you're just waiting around. It means that you're actively pursuing God, you're pushing forward, but you're enduring. That's what the word means. You have to endure those hard times. So he says, in your patience or your endurance, possess ye your soul. Very important. Now, verse 20, why did he say that? When you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. So he's warning them. He's telling them there's going to be armies that are going to gather around Jerusalem. And when they see that happen, this is a prophecy. They know the desolation is near. Verse 21. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. So he said, when you see... These times of trouble coming, the time of desolation coming, when the armies are going to gather around Jerusalem like that, you start seeing that come to pass, prepare yourself. You migrate. You leave Jerusalem. You get out of town. You go into the caves. You go into the mountains, okay? Don't stay there. And I'll we'll tell you why in just a minute, okay? Verse 22. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be what? Great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. Now what's he talking about? He's talking about 70 A.D. This is a prophecy that was given in the early 30s. And about 40 years later, a Roman general named Titus fulfilled this prophecy. 
He moved his armies into the area of Jerusalem. He surrounded the city. He besieged it. And for three and a half years, okay, which is the time of the great tribulation period, there was a time of great suffering and famine, great hardship. So the Lord prepared his people in advance for that time that was going to come. Okay? He said it was going to happen. You with me here? All right? During that time, Titus, the Roman general, they started crucifying people in Jerusalem. Sometimes 500 at a time. And they kept crucifying people and crucifying people and crucifying people until there was no more place to put a cross. And no more wood to make a cross with. And over that period of time, a million people died in Jerusalem. You know who escaped? The Christianos. The Christians. One, as I've studied this in history, uh, some historians say, some theologians say that not one Christian died when Titus did this. Because they listened and heard the prophecy of Jesus Christ and when they saw it, they prepared and they left the city. Not one Christian. Other theologians say, you know, just about everybody, all Christians, escaped from Jerusalem because they heard the prophecy that the Lord had given. You So think about that. The unbeliever didn't listen to the prophecies and they went through that time of trouble and a million of them died. Horrible, horrible deaths. But the Christian who believed the prophecy of Jesus Christ, they escaped. Okay, so let me keep reading. Verse 24, They shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive in all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down in the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Amen? Okay, let's go to 19, Luke 19. Verse 43, again Jesus says, For the days shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round and round, and keep thee in on every side. And that goes along with the same prophecy of Luke chapter 21. Okay, So 70 A.D., that prophecy came to pass 100%. And the people who believed the prophecy, they prepared themselves. They escaped that time of trouble. And the people that didn't prepare themselves upwards to about they, they estimate one million people died at that time it was a horrible horrible time okay all right so go back to proverbs a prudent man foreseeth evil and hideth himself but the simple pass on and are punished now the christians in that day they were looked at as the simple ones but the Bible says the simple ones are the ones that see the problems coming and don't do anything about it. They don't prepare. Right? They just keep on going on. You know, keep on going forward doing what they're doing. Amen? But the so-called simple ones prepared for the danger. They avoided it because they believed the Word of God. How many of y'all believe the Word of God? Now, that's on the higher level. That's the theological aspect of wisdom, the fear of the Lord, hearing His prophecies and preparing for end-time events, so on and so forth. Now, it also has practical application. And that is, if you see something that's coming down the road, you know, whatever, financially or marital, you name it, okay? you got a problem. What do you do? You prepare for it. You know, you don't just keep on going until it all breaks, breaks and falls apart. It's not wise. You take steps beforehand. You say, you know what? I'm saying I need to make adjustment here. So it's wise if you do that, okay? You're preparing the future for the future, right? I think it's wise to store food because you're preparing for the future. Now, you may not need it in your lifetime, but you may. It may not be the time when Jesus is going to come back. I believe it is. But it may not be the time of the tribulation period. I personally believe we're getting very close to that, all right? But even if it's not the time of the tribulation period, if you store some food, amen, let's say a catastrophe hits your city, 
Well, it may not be the great tribulation period, but you're prepared. You've got food. So it's wise to prepare in advance for hardships that are going to come, to save money, to prepare that way, to, to store food, whatever. You know what I'm saying? Just to take the steps against the future. Amen. And prepare against the future. Hallelujah. So the Word of God is true. Amen. Okay, let's go to verse 4. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. By the fear of the Lord. If you fear, so we're moving to the higher level again. Fearing God. What are you going to get when you fear God? Honor, riches, and life. Where do you find riches? True riches. Where do you find them? In the world? No, you find two ri true riches at, at Calvary. Not the world, at Calvary. That's where you find true riches. Now, let's go over here. Let's look at a, a man in the New Testament. His name was Paul. It's 2 Timothy chapter 4. And I'll give you an example of a man who found his riches in Christ. Okay, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 6. Okay, you there? 2 Timothy 4, 6. Okay, for I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. What's he talking about? Okay, so he's in Rome at this time when he's writing Timothy and he's te he knows he's fixing to die. Okay? He knows he's fixing to die. So that's what he's saying when he says, uh, I'm ready to be offered the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my, my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. He found true riches. Amen? A crown of righteousness. When he wrote this, you know where he is? He's in a dungeon. He's in a prison cell called Merentine Prison Cell. And that prison cell had an upper and a lower chamber. And it was basically a pit in Rome. And they took him and they lowered him down into the lower chamber of that prison house. It was damp. Okay. There was rats everywhere for those prisoners. Some, in fact, in, in some of the writings about that prison that he, he was in before he was executed, rats literally ate the prisoners alive. So Paul was placed in that pit with a bunch of rats. They had to lower the food down to even get food to him. It was damp. It was cold. Okay. Now think about that man. When he wrote that, he talks about this crown of righteousness that's laid up for him. And that's what his riches was. But before he became a believer, a Christian, think about his background. He was a Roman citizen. A Roman citizen. He had the status to walk in any door, anywhere, anytime. If you're a Roman, Roman citizen, it would open doors for you. A status. He was educated, a scholar, a Greek scholar. The Apostle Paul could speak and write the Greek language fluently. And obviously as a Hebrew, he knew the Hebrew language as well. He was a scholar. Amen? He was trained at the feet of Gamaliel, considered to be one of the greatest rabbis that were alive in that day. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel. Highly educated man. Extremely educated man. So not only status as a Roman citizen, but educated, a scholar, a Greek scholar. And thirdly, the Scriptures of Israel. He knew the Scriptures of the nation of Israel that God had given the nation of Israel. That means with the status and the scholarly background, and the knowledge he had of scriptures as an Israelite, 
That man had money. He had prestige. He had position before he became a believer. And after he became a believer, he counted all of that as dung that he might gain Christ. For him, the earthly riches grew pale. They grew dim. And so now when he's about to be not only placed in prison in Rome, here he's about to go and be executed, be beheaded. But he counted that as a rich, rich experience. He found true riches in Jesus Christ. They took him out of that prison. They cut his head off. And his head, tradition says, not the Bible, but tradition says it bounced three times. In Rome today, if you go to Rome, they will take you to the so-called place where he was ex executed, and it's called the place of three fountains. And they say that every place that his head bounced, a fountain sprang. Okay? That's why it's called the, fount the, fount the three fountains, the place of three fountains. Now, I don't know where his head is, where his head was, but I know where his heart was. Because the Bible says in Timothy, he had a crown. And to him, that was what was the most important thing. He was willing to leave it all behind. The status, the scholar, the knowledge as an Israelite, that he might gain Jesus Christ. And so this verse tells us what true riches is. True riches are not found in the world. True riches are found in serving Jesus Christ. Amen? Nicodemus, the one that came to this by night and just told him about the new birth, Nicodemus was an extremely wealthy man. He became a Christian, came, became a believer, and he gave it away. Because he found true riches in Jesus Christ. Amen? And that's the truth of the Word of God. You're going to find true riches at Calvary. Now the world, the world, and I'll get into it in a little bit when we talk about training up a child in the way they say he should go. The world's values, the world's, you know, we send our kids to school or whatever. And you know what the school system's going to teach them? They're going to teach them the values of the world. Now I'm not putting down education. But what I'm saying is, they're going to they're gonna say, now, this is the way you can succeed in the world. Okay? Success, be successful in the world. Make a lot of money, whatever. Uh, but true success is not found in the world. True success is found in the world to come. Amen? And so, amen. Praise the Lord. Do you believe that today? True riches. Now, I'm not saying God won't bless you here. He can bless you here. Amen? But the true riches are with Jesus Christ, living for Him and serving Him. Amen? So verse 4, humility, staying humble before God, and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Paul found that to be true. Amen. He's willing to give it all up. Okay, verse 5. Thorns and snares are in the way of the froward, and he that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. Okay. The froward person is the person who is perverse. They're wicked. They're people that you can't tell anything, that you can't change them. They just refuse to change. Uh, they're not right with God. Okay. And uh, they're just basically rebellious is what they are. And so God tells us here that thorns or snails are in the way of the froward. Thorns and snares. Now thorns come from God. Snares come from the devil and from people. So if you and I get froward, we get rebellious toward the things of God, then what's going to happen to us? The Bible says it's going to be painful. There's going to be thorns. God's going to send thorns. And there's going to be snares. The enemy and men. So the way of, of a person, the forward, you can maybe call him a backslider, is not a good thing. 
Sometimes people, if they go away from the Lord, you know, that for a while it looks like they're doing really good. But take it from me, okay? Now, I've never backslid, thank God, for the, by the grace of God. But I, I have known some people that have. And I've asked, asked one young man uh, who I had a hand and went into the Lord. And not in this church, but when I was first in the church. I asked this young man, he backslid away from the Lord. And he came back to church, you know, and repented and got refilled with the Holy Ghost. And man, when he first walked through the doors, his hair, he looked like a demoniac, man. I mean, he was in bad shape. But anyway, uh, you know who I'm talking about if I'm calling by name. And So I asked him, I said, how was it, you know, when you were in the world, backslid away from the Lord? Because it looks like, it appears like they're doing real well. He said, I was miserable. Miserable all the time. Why is that? It's because God will hedge up your way with thorns. Now, listen. He didn't say He put a wall in front of you. He said He put thorns in front of you. Now, that, that means that if it's not a brick wall, that means if it's thorns, you, you can get through thorns. Yeah, you, you can push your way through. You can find a way to get through the thorns. But once you get through there, you're going to find out, man, they pierced your hands, your legs. I don't remember. I saw uh, on Smithsonian Channel these female warriors. <clears throat> they were training to be uh, warriors in the kingdom. These females, female warriors. And in order to pass <coughs> into becoming a warrior, they had to do something very painful. They had to literally, they put a bunch of thorns, big old long thorns out on a path. And those female warriors had to crawl on those thorns. And man, pain, just pain. Piercing their hands and their legs, man, bleeding. And they made it. They got through the thorns. But there was pain. There was blood everywhere, man. And you could see them just grimacing <clears throat> as they were crawling on those thorns. Well, see, that's what God is saying. It's like if you and I become forward with God, forward with God, you know, disobedient and rebellious and, and we leave the ways of God. Yeah, it's not a wall, you know. You're going to be able to find your way through somehow, but it's going to be painful. Now, you need to thank God for that. God would send the thorns so that it is painful. You need to thank God for that. Amen? And the snares, the enemy come. I'm going to tell you something, man. The enemy can sting you. The enemy can sting you. You look at the book of Revelation. The Bible talks about these creatures coming out of the abyss. They got the tails of a stinging scorpion. Where would they come out of? They came out from the pit. And the Bible said they're going to sting men. You with me here? So the enemy can sting you. But God puts thorns. And, and then man, you know, you're going through life. Well, man, I'm going to tell you something. Man will be a snare to you as well. If you're forward. Say, praise the Lord. You, get with me? you with me? You understand what I'm telling you? Oh, let's go over to the Word of God in the book of Hosea, chapter 2. How many of you are blessed by the Lord? And you know you're blessed by the Lord. Well, sometimes we forget that. We forget that the blessings that we have in life are from God. I think we forget about how good we have it. I am I'm extremely blessed tonight. Okay, look at Hosea 2, please. I won't get into all the details. It gets complicated when you're dealing with Hosea and Gomer. I'm not going to teach you the, the book of Hosea tonight. But we know that Gomer went away from the Lord. And so she is a type and a picture of Israel, wayward Israel, going away from the Lord. And so the Bible says, verse 6, Hosea 2, Therefore, behold, I will hedge up thy way with what? Thorns. Why does God hedge up the person's way with thorns? So you won't find your lovers. So you won't find satisfaction in this way that you've chosen, which is being forward and going away from God. God doesn't want you to be satisfied without Him in your life. 
Okay? So he, as he says here, I will hedge up thy way with thorns and make a wall. In this case, it's a wall. That she shall not find her paths and she shall follow after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them. She shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then shall she say, I will go and return to my first husband, for then was it better with me than now. See, that's what happens sometimes. We don't realize how blessed we are, how good we have it in God. If, if we go away from the Lord, then these thorns come in our life. Yeah, we can try to keep pressing through, but it's painful. And God is trying to get us to turn back to Him. And remember how good you had it. Right? Like she says here, I'll go and uh, return to my first husband, for then was it better with me than now. For she did not know that I gave her corn and wine and oil, multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for by all. See? Didn't know. Where all the blessings came. You and I don't think we realize how blessed we are to be in the kingdom of God, to be in the house of God, to be serving the Lord. All the blessings, the corn, the wine, the oil that He gives you. And to go away from that, what you have is thorns in the place of that. So it's not something that we want to do. Amen? So going back to 22 and 5, thorns and snares are in the way of the forward. He that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. So he takes it a step further and he even talks about if you know people that are living this way, okay, you stay away from them. Why? Because if you stay away from them, you'll keep your soul. If you start running with them, you will become like them. So if you're a wise individual, you stay away from the forward. Okay? Some people come to mind like Korah in the Old Testament. Now Korah got a group together, you know. Some of them followed Korah. And uh, they didn't end up in a good place. But you know what his sons did? There are psalms in the Bible that are written by the sons of Korah. You know what they did? They didn't follow in the footsteps of their daddy. Jewish writings say that when the pit, the old earth opened up, that the sons of Korah repented uh, uh, from the sin of their daddy. And they start, as soon as they repented and separated from the sins of their father in rebellion, they started singing. God gave them these supernatural songs that they in turn gave to David, and David wrote them down. See? So they were wise, weren't they, to distance themselves, even though it was their father, they were wise to distance themselves from the forward, and in doing so, they kept their soul. Amen? Now, you might say, well, I'm strong enough, I can handle it, you know, they're not going to influence me, they will. Amen? So if we go by the Word of God then, thorns and snares are in the way of the forward. He that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. That's smart, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Think of Saul. Now, I don't have time tonight, but I've, there's ten steps that I could teach you about Saul. Ten steps, all right? Starting with disqualification all the way down to damnation. And there are ten steps that he took. And I, I'm not, I don't have time. I'm not going to keep you all night and teach you those steps maybe sometime in the future. But he went from disqualification all the way to damnation. He started out good. He started out well. But then he started disobeying God. Okay? And getting forward with the things of God. And he was tested by the prophet Samuel to see if he would obey or not. And he didn't. So it just went from bad... You know, it went from good, then to bad, and then to worse. All right, all right. And so what happened? Ultimately, he ended in damnation by committing suicide on the battlefield after seeking counsel from a witch because God wouldn't even talk to him anymore. He pleaded with God for visions and dreams for direction because the battle with the Philistines was about to come. Silence. He went to God in prayer for direction. The battle is about to come. 
and the heavens were like brass. And he goes into the battlefield and he dies. He commits suicide and went into a lost eternity. Okay? So it's not... <laughs> We don't want to be like Saul. We don't want to be like Kor. We don't want to be anybody, like these people that go away from God. It, it is not worth it. You know, the world says, hey, come on out here. It's a good thing. You know, be, do your own thing, whatever. Uh, but anyway, but not only that, we need to, as the Scripture says, thorns and snares are in the way of the forward. He that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. Be careful. Amen. Amen. In, in, people influence you. They influence me. So tonight, are you hanging around people that are influencing you for positive things? Are they influencing you in the things of God? Ask yourself the question. The people that I'm around, is it a positive influence? Is it making me better? Is it making me stronger in God? Or when I get around them, is it a bad influence? You stay away from it. Okay, you say amen. All right, that's the Word of God. Verse 6. <clears throat> uh, train up. Say train up. Train. The Hebrew word train means to hedge in. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Training is better than teaching. Training is better than speaking. Because training means to, as I said, the Hebrew word means to hedge up or to put a fence around them. Say, whoa, is that in the Bible? We're supposed to put our children in fences? Yeah, that's the Hebrew word. Why are you going to fence them in? Why are you going to put boundaries around them, borders around them like that? You're not supposed to just tell them what to do. That's the point. You're supposed to put a boundary, a fence around them. And why, why do you do that? Because you're telling them this is the way to go. This is the only way to go right here. You don't go here. You don't go there. You know, you don't go here. There's only one way right here. You're going to go that way. And you've got to hedge them out. You've got to put boundaries around them to keep them going the right direction. That's what the word train means. Okay? You know what educate means? Educate doesn't mean to reveal something to your kids. Educate means to take something out of them. To educate means I'm going to take some stuff out of my children that's not good. Because they, you know, now listen, parenting is not an easy thing. Training up a child in the way it should go is not an easy thing. I've had two of them. Still do. Okay? How many of y'all know it's hard to raise children? It's hard to raise them. So if you're going to educate them, then what you got to do is you got to reach in somehow and pull out of them what shouldn't be in there and then hedge, hedge them in, put them in a fence, put some boundaries around them. Say, no, you're not doing that. You're not doing that. And you are going to church. You are going to Sunday school. Well, I don't want to go to Sunday school. You ever heard that philosophy that some parents have? Well, I'll just let them grow up and I'll let them decide for themselves. Bad decision. Bad, I'm going to tell you again. Bad decision. You say, well, I just want them to, you know, to do it for themselves. Well, they're not going to do it for themselves when they're little. You're going to have to put a fence around them. Say, this is it. This is the way right here. So, as long as my family goes to church, my kids are going to go to church, and I'm going to tell them, my family goes to church, and you're going to. So, well, I don't think you ought to do that. I think they ought to have a choice in the matter. I don't. Now, when they get older, they become adults, they can but until then, no, you're going to church. That's just the way it is. Amen? So what? Well, what if little Johnny got up in the morning and, and walked up to the table, breakfast is there on the table, and little Johnny or little Susie looks up and says, I'm not going to school anymore. 
I'm done with school. Now, whether it's homeschool or whatever, he's done with school or she's done with school. Would you look at them and say, well, you know, maybe I'll just let them decide for themselves. No, you will say, you're going to school. So why do we become timid when it comes to the things of God? It's a trick of the devil. It's philosophy of people. Amen? You with me here? Or if your child is sick and needs medicine, are you going to look at your kid and say, well, I think I'll just leave it up to you. No, if they need the medicine, you're going to make them take the medicine. Am I right? So where does this idea come from where we're just going to let them decide for themselves? You're going to let them decide when, to, when they need medicine, when they don't need medicine? You're going to let them decide when they need to do school and when they don't need to do school? Why do they come in the house and they've been in the mud? Playing in the mud. They're covered from head to toe in mud. You're going to let them make the decision whether or not they want to be clean or dirty? No, you're going to take them to the bathroom and say, you're going to take a shower because you will be clean. You get the point? So if you won't let them decide about whether or not they should take medicine or, or do schoolwork or be clean or dirty, then why in the world would you give them that decision which has to do with their eternal destination? It sounds good, doesn't it? It, it? it has a good ring to it philosophically, but it's not from God. No, you're going to Sunday school. I don't want to go. You're going. And by the way, you're going to learn your memory verse too. I don't want... You're going to learn your memory verse. Your Sunday school teacher asks you to do something, asks you to read your Bible. You're going to read your Bible too. I don't want to. I don't care. You're going to read your Bible. Get the point? How many of you ever heard that philosophy? Well, I'm just going to let them decide for themselves. I've heard it. You've heard it. doesn't mean you live by that. I'm just saying what you've heard it, right? Brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you something. Now, Listen. I don't believe in the Jesuit faith or the community of the Jesuits. I don't believe in that. It's a very evil society. But I will tell you something about the Jesuits. They knew you had seven years, seven years to put the Word of God, to put the, a boundary around that child. You had seven years. And they said the first seven years of their life are critical. You got seven years. That means it's train up a child the way they should go. As soon as they basically are out of the crib, they're in infancy, you're going to start putting boundaries around them, fences around them, putting the Word of God in them, training their mind. If you're going to train them, you've got to train their mind. You say, well, I don't think I should, I should tell my children what to, how to think or what to think. You're wrong. If you don't, if you don't break their will as a child, they're going to break your heart. Amen. One woman raised her kid, 17 years old. That kid cussing and causing all kinds of problems in their house. So the woman, you know, there's a lot of advice givers out there, right? So she wrote, said, Give me some advice. I forget to who she was trying to get advice from. It doesn't matter. The point is this. The advice came back to her. The kid was just unruly, cussing, you know, causing all kinds of problems in the house. The advice was reverse time. Take them back. Reverse 17 years and start over again. And the point being is if you don't get them at an early age, you've lost them. Seven years is critical. And then after seven years, you've got about ten more years to add on to that. 
all the principles of the Word of God you possibly can. And if you'll raise, if you'll raise your, your kids in the church, now eventually, there's some people say, well, I tried, and my kids aren't living for the Lord. Are they still alive? Are, are you with me? Are they still alive? They might not be living for the Lord right now, but you put so much of God in them and the thing you raise them in the things of God. You think at some point that if God hedges up their ways with thorns and allows snares from the enemy and man to come into their life so that they're going through very hard times. Amen. That eventually they might come back to God, come back to the house of God. If they're not dead, amen, you hold on. You keep praying. Because you know, you say, well, it didn't work for me. Well, this is not a promise. This is a general truth. Amen? So the first seven years of their life, especially once they get out of the crib, man, just look at them and say, it's time for me to put a fence around you. That's what the word train means. I'm going to hedge you in. That means I'm going to show you one way. <laughs> okay? And I'm going to educate you. I'm going to educate you. I'm going to take everything out of you that's not supposed to be in there. That's what training means. Okay, you with me here? Say praise the Lord. So you got to work with their mind, number one. You got to teach them the, the things of God. Put the Word of God in them. Hallelujah. Put the Word of God in them. Teach them the things of God. As I said earlier, the school system is geared to teach your kids to succeed in this world. Okay? And I believe that God wants you to succeed. I don't, but I'm talking about ultimate success. Listen, brother and sister, I talked to a man just the other day on the telephone. He doesn't come to this church. He's been one time. Okay. All kinds of stuff going on in his home. And, uh, this is a long story. He talked about this and he talked about that, this son and, this grandkid and just on and on the story, man. Okay. At the end of everything he said, he was disappointed, you know, because his grandson wasn't continuing to play football. He's supposed to, I guess, a star on the team. And his grandson, I, son, I don't want to, I don't want to do that anymore. And that broke that grandfather's heart because they're really into football, man. Okay. And so after this man got through telling me all of these things, you know, about his son, some difficult times, and grandson, things they were going through, his, his daughter just recently had a divorce. And I sat there and I listened to him. And at the end, I told him this. I didn't get to say a lot. I just listened and let him talk. But at the end, I said, let me tell you something, the way I look at things. This is my ultimate goal with my kids is that they do what God wants them to do in life. I said, as long as they stay in the will of God, I said, I don't care where they go or I don't care what they do as long as they stay in the will of God. He goes, wow. Because he, he, he claims to be a believer. He goes, wow. Thank you for telling me that. See, all of these things that he was talking about that was important to him, you know, and, and maybe at times to the others, really was just for time. But when I told him, as far as I'm concerned, brother and sister, I'm going to tell you this way I really believe. I, I look at myself as a, fa a failure as a father. I don't care how rich my kids become. I don't care what kind of jobs they get, what kind of education they have. If they don't live for God, to me, to me, they're a failure. That's the way I look at it. And that's what I told him. So I said, 
My son is in, in uh, Taiwan right now. I'm happy. I miss him, but I'm happy. Because as long as they're in the will of God, they can go where they want to and do what they want to. And that's what I tell them. That's what I tell my daughter. And that's what I tell my son. I said, but if you ever try to live without God, where you go and what you do in life will be a failure. That's what I tell my kids. And so he hung up the telephone after that. He just told me, he said, thank you. So that's what I'm going to focus on. You know, because he was focused on all this stuff, man, all the problems and, and, you know, the person don't want to play football. And I want to, come on, man. Are they living for the Lord? You're, if they're living for the Lord, you're, you're a, par- if a parent today, they're living for God, you're a success. So you got to train them. Because the education system, and again, I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just telling you their goal. Their goal is to take your kid and say, this is how you can succeed in the world. Your goal as a parent, you may help them accomplish that, but your goal as a parent is, number one, to get their eyes on the world to come. You here with me today? That's what you got to do. You got to hedge them in. You got to teach them the Word of God. All right. Straight and narrow path, man. What would it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? That's the way I feel. I believe this. See, I believe this. I believe with all my heart. Amen. So, with a mind, you got to train their mind. You gotta train their emotions. How many know your kids cry and laugh, scream and hate and love? Have y'all seen any of those in your kids? Have y'all seen hatred? Love? Crying? Screaming? Emotions, right? If you're gonna train them, you don't just train their mind. You gotta train their emotions. You gotta teach them. You got an emotion of fear. You know what you need to do with that fear? Fear sin. Fear sinning against God. You have an emotion inside of you. Love. It's not just for a young man or a young girl. It's God. Love God. Hate sin. Fear sin. So you gotta teach them, train them, because I told you wisdom has to do with emotion as well. You gotta teach them how to use their emotions correctly. They got a lot of emotional people. Amen. Sometimes I get emotional. You get emotional? I get emotional. How many people get any out here get emotional? Y'all have emotions? I'm glad to know that. Brother Patrick, you get emotional? You have emotions? I'm glad, man. I do. Right? The philosophers try to teach a story says, don't have emotion. Don't feel anything. Good or bad. No, you got emotions. So you're going to have to teach them how to use their emotion. Amen. Praise the Lord. My son was in cross country. He was running cross country not with our, our team but in a different team and he'd get to running and man he just he just hurting so bad he you know he'd he'd get emotional and the coach would look at him and say get your emotions under control right so he'd tell him well eventually Jeremiah could got his emotions under control and started doing something but as long as he'd go to pieces you know and oh this is killing me <laughs> he said, get your emotions under control. Well, when he did, he could do something. So we have to teach your kids how to handle emotions, what to do with emotions. Right? So the mind, your emotions, and the will. The will, say the will. You have to break the will. Not the spirit, but you have to break the will. 
And you've got a short window of about seven years to break that wheel. All right? And it's, I promise you, it's no fun. It's painful for the child and for you. But you have to do it. Because I'm going to tell you, if you don't break the wheel, they're going to break your heart. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I mean, some of us really tried hard. And then you got the strong-willed kid, strong-willed child, right? And no matter what you do, you can't break that wheel. So, seven years to try, ten more years on that, and then after that, give them to God. Say, Lord, I tried to break the wheel, couldn't break it, now you're going to have to. And He knows how. So you've got to train the mind, you've got to train the emotions, you've got to train the will in that child. So you don't just tell them what to do. You don't just speak to them. It's good to talk to them. It's important to talk to your kids. But this is what you do if you're going to train them. Hedge them up. Put a fence around them. Amen. Mind, will, and emotions. Alright? Don't just let your kids... And I'm talking about children here. I'm not talking about when they become adults. They become adults as a totally different approach. They're adults. Okay? But when they're kids, don't let them decide for themselves what's good for them. Because they don't know what's good for them. You let them, well, okay, you, you put white donuts on the table, or you put broccoli. Unless they're just unusual. They're going to go for the white sugar covered donuts every time. You know what I'm saying? I, very, how many of y'all have kids you put donuts or, or whatever kind of donut? Donuts or, or broccoli. How many are going to go for the broccoli? Right? He's lifted his hand. He go for the broccoli? Okay, well, see, there's a, there's a few of them that have been hedged in that have been... That's because that's all he had was broccoli. You never brought the donuts out. So when you brought the donuts out later in life, he didn't even know what they were. That's why. <laughs> I mean, that's why you don't let, let kids decide for themselves. It just it doesn't work out. So, amen. Okay. Last thing you want to do is the conscience. You have to train the conscience. Because the conscience is that part on the inside of us that God uses to sort of like be a, a warning that goes off in you about wrong and right. Now, the conscience can be seared as a hot iron. Right? You can teach them to have a conscience. You can also teach them to not have a conscience. Man, hey, you know, I'm just telling you the truth. I knew one person in my life, one person in my life, I don't think he had a conscience. Because he'd sit down and, and they'd give him a lie detector's test and it would never read. Would it, Christina? Don't have any. Now, I don't think anybody in here don't have a conscience. you got a conscience, I think. But I knew one man. I don't think he had a conscience. <laughs> he had one, but he had so through the years seared it, he could control, man. You know? Even a lie detector's test. Praise the Lord. So we don't want our kids like that. We want them to have tender consciences. Like a, your brother, died, brother uh, Edmonds, long time ago, and I, you know, you're looking at these verses, and I'm only on verse six, and I've got 29 here, and I know what you're thinking, but see, you don't know everything, because I'm stopping at 10. <laughs> okay, so anyway, I have to do that. But Emma's talked about the conscience like a balloon. 
It's very thin. You have to be careful because <clears throat> you want that conscience to be so tender like just the point of a needle and it touches a balloon, poof, pop the balloon. You want that conscience to be so tender just a little, little wrongdoing that it bothers you. Okay? So you've got to teach your kids their mind, their emotions, their will, and their conscience. To have a conscience. Praise the Lord. There's some people can lie at you, looking at you. In the church. Not any right now. When we first started the church over on Brazos, I looked at the man. That man, I looked him in the eyes and he lied to me claiming to be a brother. Claiming to be a saint in the church. I go, man. And he never flinched. See, some people raised, they raised to have no conscience at all. They have a seared conscience. Like a, Seared with a hot iron. How many, how many of you have a conscience? You still have a conscience left. Okay, is it tender? Is it like a pin? Whew, touching the balloon? Pah! Is that where your conscience is? Just any little thing bothers you. That's a good thing. Amen. Brother, you alright? Okay. Okay, verse 7. Look at 7. And then look at your number and say, we're almost done. I hope you have a guilty conscience for sitting there worrying about me moving so slow through the Scriptures. Okay, verse 7. You there? Okay, the rich ruleth over the poor and the borrow is servant to the lender. Now, practically speaking, right, if you, you take out a loan, you become the servant. The bank becomes the lender. You're a slave to that lender. So it's better not to borrow money, right? Now, verse 7 is, listen. Okay, I'm almost done, so y'all be, y'all be good. Be good. Look. The rich ruleth over the poor, the borrower is servant to the lender. Notice something. Solomon is not telling you that it's wrong. He's not saying it's wrong. He's just making a statement. And what is that statement? The rich rule over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. He doesn't say if it's wrong or right. Correct? But it's a true statement. You borrow money, you become a slave to the person that's lending it to you. So the less money you borrow, the less of a slave you are for whatever it's worth, okay? It's the Bible. You can be full bore slave. You can be in debt over your head, right? You're a slave. Man. I believe the Word of God. So the poor, the, the rich rule over the poor, the borrower servant to the lender. Capitalism is basically that principle right there. Capitalism, and again, he's not saying capitalism is a bad thing, but you don't find this, the rich ruling over the poor and the borrower servant to the lender in communism. Communism puts all its workers in debt to the state. They all have to work for the state. And you know what eventually happens? Communism is promoted by socialistic governments. Socialism. And we've got people today that are being voted into office that are socialists. And they're trying to turn the United States of America into a socialistic country. A socialist country. Socialism, where everybody works, right, for the state, for the government. And the government takes care of them. Socialism always ends up with everybody bankrupt. It doesn't work. Okay, so these people that are trying to push socialism on the United States of America, everybody gets free college. Everybody gets free health care. Free, really? No, somebody's got to pay for it. 
You know what's going to happen? You know how you're going to pay for it? You're going to go to work if socialism prevails in the United States of America. You're going to go to work. You're going to support the government. And then the government's going to pay, distribute the money. All right? So you lose your freedom. So you hear these people talk about these big, good talkers, man, like Bernie Sanders and this young woman who just recently won. I can't even think of her name. Pushing socialism. Man, that sounds good. Free college, free health care. Right? Yeah, you lose your freedoms. And you become a state-run institution. This verse is capitalism. The rich rule over the poor. You know who in history have been the greatest capitalist? You know capitalism, right? You know, free enterprise like the United States has. You know who are the greatest capitalist in history? The Jews. Okay? The Jewish people, after they came out of Babylonian captivity, while they were in Babylonian captivity, for whatever reason, they started falling in love with money. Okay, y'all, now, I, I'm not, you know I'm not anti-Semitic, okay? But I know and you know and the Jews know, they're, most of the time, they're pretty good business people. Okay? They're pretty shrewd business people. They're known to be tight with their money. You with me here? Okay. Right? So the Jews in history after the Babylonian captivity, they came out and they had a love for money. So what they did, the ages in the middle, uh, the medieval days, up into the 10th century, they started having financial endeavors. They were loaning money to kings and to nobles and to ordinary men, Jewish people. If kings or noblemen needed money, they went to the Jews. And the Jews gave them money at a charge. And by the 10th century, they had commerce and banking endeavors in Africa, in India, in the Middle East, China. You with me? Because they were huge capitalists. And it wasn't until the Europe, Europe, uh, Europeans the middle class of Europe came on that that monopoly was broken. Up, up at that point, they, they had a monopoly on capitalism, banking, and charging interest on money and whatnot. Okay? That's why they're so wealthy. Jewish people are very wealthy. In, their, in the Talmud, the Jewish Talmud is a, a teaching. It teaches how to live as a Jewish person. Okay? And in that Talmud, they actually have a section that teaches you how to use finances. Gives you the basics, contracts, how to sign contracts, what contracts are, uh, uh, are about, you know. Basic business principles in the Talmud. Okay? So they were the capitalists. So it's true. Some of the richest men in the world were Jewish men. With me here? This is a true statement. The rich ruth over the poor, they borrow with servant to the lender. So what is it teaching us in verse 7? 7, 8, 9 is talking about sowing and reaping. Sowing and reaping. Verse 8, He that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity, and the rod of his anger shall fall. There's another thing that you can sow. Is different from finances. Verse 7 deals with finances. Okay, with me here? All right, so praise the Lord. How many of y'all would like to be the person that people borrow from instead of you? Me too, brother. <laughs> me too, brother. I'm with you. That's a lot better. It's better to be the person that people borrow money from than the person that has to borrow from somebody. Right? Amen. Say praise the Lord. Because then you rule. Now, that's not a bad thing. Come on. God wants you to rule in life. And the way to rule in life is to, to handle your finances in such a way 
He said, you borrow money all the time. You prepare your, yourself in such a way financially that you'll be the one that lends. I know y'all are sitting there saying, that is impossible. That will never happen to me. It can if you change your thinking. See? It can if we'll change our thinking. I don't know if I've even made connection with any of y'all tonight at all, but I'm really, I'm really trying, you know. But I think we can, we can change, it will change our thinking instead of having a borrower's mentality where every time we need something, man, credit card or go to the bank and get the loans for the cars or whatever, you know. Loans for the clothes. Loans for everything. We'll change the way we think. Instead of always borrowing money, say, no, I'm going to save. I'm going to live different. And maybe someday I'll be wealthy enough that I won't have to borrow. If you don't, you might not be the person that's lending money to anybody else, but I'm going to tell you something. If you start, if you can get to a place where you no longer have to borrow money, you rule. That's the point. As long as you keep on having to borrow all the time, borrow money all the time, guess what? You're a servant. How many of y'all want to rule in life? Then set some goals in your life that you're going to get to a place in your life where you're not going to borrow anymore. You're going to pay cash for everything. And if you do, even though you don't lend to anybody to make interest on them, you rule. Now, you're listening to a 55-year-old man. I mean, I'm almost Cain level. All right? And it... <laughs> I got 55 years of bad experience I'm sharing with you right now. Okay, now I don't have a, a credit score of, uh, we don't have a credit score of over 800 for no reason. Okay, I think 850 is a perfect credit score. And we might be pushing that. Now, let me just say that to you. When I say I got a, we have a perfect credit score of about 850, you know what that tells you? I have borrowed Money, which means I haven't been ruling. I've been a slave for 50, I'm 55 years old. I'm just letting you know, an old man talking to some of you old people, you're never going to change. But some of you young people, young couples, <laughs> listen to this old man. You get to a place where you can say no to borrowing money. You know, you can get to a place that I'm not going to buy a car unless I pay cash for it. Really, I know the house is different unless, I mean, God can supernaturally bless you that way too. You know what I'm saying? But I don't know anybody, personally, that doesn't have to pay something on a house. But I tell you what gets us cars and clothes and eating out and all that. Now, I'm just saying, take it for what it's worth. If you want to keep living that way, that's your business, not mine. Okay, don't get mad at me. But I'm just telling you, I'm 55 years old, and I'm finally starting to understand there's a way to rule in life, there's a way to be a slave in life. And the way to be a slave is to be a borrower. Okay? So have, say praise the Lord. How many of y'all want to listen to an old oh, man? Good. I'm glad. Okay, you can do it. You can get to a place where the only thing you have by way of debt, the only thing you have by way of debt is your house, and that's it. I'm not going to buy a car and, and finance it. I'm not going to buy anything and put it. If I put it on a credit card, I'm paying it off by the end of the month. If you'll get that in your mind at young age, listen, this old man that's got a great credit score. <laughs> If I'm still around when you turn 55, you're going to be rich, man. You'll probably have two or three houses paid for and renting them out. And, you know, if you do it my way, you'll still be paying on a house. I'm 55 years old. My house should already be paid for. That's right. You with me? Now, praise the Lord. But thank you, Jesus. I made a decision. My wife and I made a decision today. We don't have no more car payments. None. Okay? So, and I told her, I said, you know, I got two cars that are paid for. 
And I said, the next one I buy, I probably need one. The next one I buy, I'm paying cash for it. Okay? And that, if it's like a clunker, clunker level, or mid-range, or brand new, doesn't matter. Clunker, mid-range, or brand new, I'm going to pay cash for it. All right? So you see me driving a clunker? So oh, poor pastor, look at driving a clunker. That's all right. I'll be having cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching in the bank. <laughs> okay? See, I'm, I'm exchanging some of my riches for wealth. Wealth you can't see. You know, for what it's worth, you want to listen to an old man? Hallelujah. Okay? The, you with me here? So how many of y'all want to rule in life? The point is, don't be in debt then. You'll rule, you'll rule, you'll rule. God wants to bless you. Is this? Hallelujah. Next thing I'll tell you, and I, see, I, I'm glad I've decided to just go to verse 10, but I know you are too. <laughs> but I'll tell, tell you another thing too. And I learned this. I, this, this is some of the stuff I'm bringing to you. I didn't, you know, it didn't come up fresh revelation with me. I've learned this by experience or from other people, you know. But don't go to your boss and say, hey, boss, man, things are really tough right now. Can I get an advance on my check? Don't ever do that. You know why? Not because you're not going to work it out, you know, and put the time in. That's not what I'm talking about. When you tell that boss, give me an advance, you're telling him, this person has to have this job and I can put them under my thumb. Yeah, well, they know. They pretty much know you need the job. But you go over there and tell them you need advance. Then see, that tri that lets them know I can put... You know, keep them under my thumb. Don't ever do that. Don't, don't ask for advances. Hello? Hello? For what it's worth. I don't, give me Bible, give me verse and chapter. I don't have it. <laughs> okay? But the rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Amen? Save, save, save. Now, don't be a miser though. Like you're counting your little coins. Every night you get them out and you pour them out. I mean, you don't have to live like that. Right? You just won't enjoy anything in life. You know, you can buy a pair of brand new tennis shoes. You don't have to buy them all at the garage sale. One, two, three, four. Five. Yeah, all there. <laughs> and some people go to the extreme, man. Bro, they're going to die and leave it to somebody else. And never, you know, wouldn't ever buy a pair of tennis shoes. Now that's misery. And we're not talking about misery stuff. That's miserable, man. Yeah. Come on, somebody. Amen. So you enjoy yourself. But watch the debt. You know what? You're blessed. Because everything here, God has allowed. Everything in this church. The, all these buildings. Everything in here. There's, you don't own one dime. Did you know that? You don't own one dime. I say you because it don't belong to me. I'm going to tell you that. I'm going to tell you this don't belong to me because I don't want anybody to get an idea that we're going to get rid of him so we can take this. I know you wouldn't think like that, but just in case you think it don't, it don't belong to me, so I'm taking a, a target off my back. Right? If we get rid of him, then we can have it. But it don't belong to me belongs to you and God. But there's you don't own anything. Not one. You don't own one penny. Amen? Isn't God good to you? Yeah. 
And I thank God for that. Woo, man, I can only imagine what it'd be like to owe a bunch of money on a church bill and making, having to make big church payments. And then I could never say anything that would offend you. And I love to offend you. <laughs> you know? I can never cross you ever. Because <sighs> if I lose you, I, you know, I can't pay the church payment. Well, hallelujah. Now that I don't have a truck payment, I can really offend you now, man. Just kidding. Just kidding. But no, that's the truth. It's a, a lot of preachers won't be able to tell people the truth. They can't say nothing. They can't cross anybody because their payments on the church are so big. You know, they know. Or that, or they're so in debt that they can't afford to speak the truth. It'll start working on you, man. you start compromising. If you get too much debt, see, you become the servant to the enemy. Because you've got so much debt, now you can't live, you can't say anything. You, you, in fact, you might be tempted to compromise the things of the world to keep your job. You see? So, hallelujah. Let's go to verse 8. Y'all want to go to verse 8? Hmm... Listen to this 55-year-old man. Sam, how old are you? 14. Amen. Says Christina, how old are you? <laughs> Too old. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Okay. Verse 8. I already read verse 8, didn't I? He that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity, and the rod of his anger shall, shall fail. He's sowing iniquity. How many of you know there's no advantage in sowing a bunch of rebellion? You know? Rebellion, iniquity, perversity, crookedness. You'll never get ahead in life if you're a crook. That's what this is talking about. But some people try to get ahead in life by being a crook. Okay, you sow iniquity or crookedness or perverseness in life. It's not a good thing. Look at Job 4 verse 8, please. You notice I said please. Even though I don't have big debt. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Got to watch myself. All right, Job 4, you there? 4 and 8, Job says, I think it's Job, no, Eliphaz, even as I have seen they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. Plow iniquity, you sow wickedness, you'll reap the same. You reap what you sow. As the New Testament says, Paul says, you shall reap what you sow. Whatsoever man sows, that shall he also reap. So to the flesh, you shall of the flesh reap corruption. So to the Spirit, you shall of the Spirit reap life eternal. Go to Hosea 8, very quickly. Sam, you just, you do what your pastor's teaching you and you'll be a millionaire by 25. Angelica, she already, she outsells everybody in the dealership. Your daddy said you got like 20 something, I think. How many you got right now? Huh? 19? How many of you that sell cars have 19 right now? Anybody have 19? No, see? You're ahead of all of them. Amen. But you're faithful to the Lord. Okay, Hosea. Brother Patrick, I'm saying this from the pulpit. Hosea 8, verse 7. Um, 
when Jeremiah gets back, I'm going to send him your direction, man. Say, Angelica's selling like 20 something cars, man. I'm going to send him your way. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay, Hosea 8 7. For they have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. It hath no stalk, the bud shall yield no meat. If so be it yield, the stranger shall swallow it up. Amen. And that's what happens when you lose sight of God. You go away from God. You sow iniquity, perverseness, the wrong way. You're known as the people of the way. Christians. And we go the wrong way and we sow the wind. We reap the whirlwind. It's not a good thing to do. So he that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity. The rod of his anger shall fail. I'm not going to read the scripture, but when you have time, go read Genesis 24. We have Rebecca and Jacob. Rebecca and Jacob. Jacob's mother, Rebecca. Right? Isaac's wife. So they trick Isaac out of the blessing. Right? Y'all remember that story? Rebecca helps Jacob get the blessing by tricking Isaac, deceiving Isaac. And you know what happened? Esau gets mad. And as a result of that, Jacob has to flee to Laban's house. We've already talked about Laban. He flees to Laban's house. Rebecca thought it was only going to be a short term thing. That she would not see Jacob for just a short period of time. Because of her deception, she never saw Jacob ever again. And Jacob, because of his deception, involvement in tricking Isaac to bless him, Jacob went over to Laban's house, and I've already read the verse to you, and Laban changed his wages ten times. That means the tricker was tricked. So Rebecca never saw her son again, and Jacob for 20 years was tricked. The tricker was tricked. You know what God is saying? He's saying, don't you ever think that sinner or saint that he ever condones that kind of lifestyle. Saint or sinner, you will not be blessed if you are a deceiver and a tricker in life. Crooked. Okay, amen? Say, so, well, I'm a Christian. God will overlook it. No, He won't. If so you pay prices, you don't realize you're going to pay. So it's best, best to be honest. If not so iniquity, he that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity. That means the wind, emptiness. You'll be empty. And the rod of his anger shall, shall fail. Verse 9, He that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he giveth his bread to the poor. So now, instead of sowing iniquity, verse 7 has to do with sowing finances. Verse 8, sowing iniquity. Verse 9 deals with sowing to the poor. If you give bountifully, God will bless you. Let's go over to Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 9. Somebody said, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Almost done. 2 Corinthians 9. 6. Paul says this, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall also reap sparingly. He which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth, purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Not grudging or of necessity, for God loveth a hilarious giver. God loves cheerful givers. Not somebody that gives, ah, oh, God, I give, and you know, grudging and just, you know. God doesn't want you to give like that. Right? He loves a cheerful giver, a hilarious giver. Why? Because you're in covenant with God. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. As is written, 
He hath dispersed abroad. He hath given to the poor. His righteousness remaineth forever. Hallelujah. Now he that ministry to the sower both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So he, if you're a sower, he's going to give you seed because he knows you're a sower. He knows you're a giver. And that's why God will bless some of you financially because he knows that you're going to sow it into, the, into his kingdom. He said, that's a person I can give to because they're going to sow into my kingdom. He gives seed to who? The, the sower. And he'll bless you. The Bible says you'll have all sufficiency. You'll have what you need and all sufficiency in life. So he's promising you abundance if you're a cheerful giver. Say praise God. Do, does it make you happy to help somebody? Does it make you happy to give? Amen. Do you know when you take what you have and you give it to somebody else and you help somebody else, it makes you happy, doesn't it? Well, it makes... Well, Thank you. I got two or three that say it did. But that's the way you're supposed to give it. You're supposed to give it with happiness, with joy. Be excited about it. So, you know. Just squeeze that old dollar, man. Is it wash is Washington the dollar bill? Isn't Washington on the dollar bill? Oh yeah, he's squeezing till he sweats. Oh whenever he's brow sweating, holding so tight. You hold that dollar bill so tight the eagle screams. <laughs> Come here, brother. Hold your hand. Yeah. See? You got it all raised closed like that? Right? Oh yeah. I left my wallet at home. You're right. You're right. You have a dollar? You got a quarter? You got a nickel? Let me have a nickel. You got a dollar. You have any change? No change? You know? You have some change? Hey, anybody else got some money? You got any money? <laughs> we'll take an offering right now, man. That looks good. No, this is all right. This will work. This will work. I'm giving it back. I'm giving it back. I'm giving it back. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> now get ready. I'm coming over here there too. Hey, here we go. Ready? So watch this. See? If I try to give him money, what's going to happen? That's what happens when you got your fist closed like that. Right? Okay. Now see if this old man can get down here and get down. <laughs> All right, see? See what happens? You can receive it. Thank you. Okay. Normally I'd let him keep it. But he but he hasn't been a good boy, so you want me to give it to him? I'll give it really. Are you happy to give it to him? <laughs> They're gonna give it to you, man. Can you believe that? That's a, like a that's dollar forty cents. It's a dollar forty. Buy you a Coke. <laughs> mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So if you're like that and live life like that, you can't ever receive either. You know? Can't let, God wants to bless you. The more you like that, the more God will just keep giving you. You say, well, I tried it. It don't work for me. Well, it's seasonal. You sow it tonight. Don't expect to have a harvest in the morning. It's seasonal. It's over a period of time. And I promise you this. If you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. You take that handful of seed, throw it in the whole field. You got an acre of land, you take one hand to seed and throw it out there. When it comes time for it to come up, do you wonder why you only have a few little little plants coming up? Because you only planted a few seed. But you take a bag full of seed, man, you throw it all out there, heavy loaded, you know, fill the ground full of seed. When it comes time for harvest, you're going to look up and it's going to be crowded, thick. 
How come? Because you sowed. That's a principle in the kingdom of God. You can outgive God. And remember, always remember, it's seasonal. Don't think you sow it today, it's going to come up tomorrow. But I promise you, it will, it will come back to you. Just like he said in 2 Corinthians 9, that you will be blessed. Your life will be blessed. It will eventually come. And sometimes you're going to go through seasons of hardship. We all, everybody does, man. Okay? But you keep being faithful to the Lord. Say amen. amen. So he, this, uh, he that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he giveth of his bread to the poor. And God will, God's watching over that. He'll make, he'll make that generate. He'll make that seed generate. He'll make it come back to you in a blessing. Amen. Praise the Lord. Last verse. Everybody looks never say last verse. Verse 10. Okay, while, while I'm going to read this verse, turn to Luke chapter 8, please. Luke 8, 53. Man, I feel good tonight. Hallelujah. I feel good. Okay, 22 and 10 of Proverbs. Cast out the scorner. The scorner is the mocker. The scorner is the scoffer. <clears throat> Mock the things of God. Scoff at the things of God. Scoff at the Word of God, you know. And uh, scoff, mock holiness. Uh, and so the Scripture says this, this scoffer or this scorner cast them out and what is, what's going to happen? Contention shall go out, yea, strife and reproach shall cease. What is he saying? That the scorner or the scoffer, as one theologian says it, he said it this way. And I study in this passage today. He said there are some people who are troublemakers. They're just troublemakers. That's who they are, okay? And so when you talk about somebody that's a troublemaker, they were, listen, brothers and sisters, there's some people seem like they would just be born to be troublemakers. You understand what I'm telling you? And I don't know if it had to do with their upbringing or what, but it seemed like they were born to be troublemakers. Okay? There's just some people that are like that. And so that scoffer, what they bring is as the Bible says here, they bring contention, they bring strife, and they bring reproach. Right? Now, what do the Bible say the answer to, uh, for the scoffer is? It says, you remove them. You cast them out. And I'll give you an example in the New Testament. Jesus did just that. In Luke chapter 8, Beginning with verse 53. Now, you know the story. Jesus is on his way to heal Jairus' daughter. Jairus' daughter. And the woman with the issue of blood touches his garment. You know the story. Delays him there. Jairus is no doubt just, you don't see him interjecting. You don't see him giving an opinion. You don't see him getting upset because the woman interfered with Jesus going to heal his daughter, do you? You don't. He just leaves it alone. But she delays Jesus. The Bible says there was a throng around him, a crowd around him. Really, the translation can be strangled him. They strangled Jesus. Jairus is in the background. He doesn't get upset with the crowd. The woman that touches the hem of his garment delays him. He doesn't get upset. But then here comes the news that the daughter, his daughter, is dead. She died. Now can you imagine if you were Jairus, you're thinking, Look, the crowd delayed him. The woman with the issue of blood delayed him. And now my daughter's dead. 
they make it to his house. You know the story. As soon as he gets there, everybody's crying. The mourner, the professional mourners are there. They are professionals. And what does Jesus do? They laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. He said, she's not dead, she's just asleep. They laughed him to scorn. Scorners. Mocking him. And he put them all out and took her by the hand and called, saying, Maid, arise. The little, one translation, you, you that are in the talit, Rise. They had her tied up in the talit. You that's in the talit, rise. Her spirit came again, and she arose straightway, and he commanded to give her meat. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them that they should tell no man what was done. You see, even Jesus was in a situation here where he was being mocked and ridiculed and scoffed at. And according to the Word of God, Jesus knew, just like Solomon knew, that there was a time when you remove people out of the picture. And when you do, the tension or the strife and the contention will go away. All of a sudden, in the place of all of that, you have peace. And brothers and sisters, when the scoffing and the scorning is removed then things can get done. And it's when Jesus stepped in and got rid of the scoffer and the scorner and the mocker that then something could get done. And Solomon knew it and Jesus knew it. And that's all, that is the only way, brothers and sisters, that the scoffer or the scorner understands anything is when they're cast out. Because they will continue to bring contention and strife until they are removed. And then, once they're removed, like in this house, in the place of the mocking and the scoffing, now we've got joy in the house. We've got peace in the house. We've got a miracle in the house. Because the scoffers are gone. Hallelujah. Say praise the Lord. Jesus knows there's some, some situations He can't do anything in until He gets rid of it. And that's the scoffer. And then when He does, then He can take care of business. can do what needs to be done. Hallelujah. Say praise the Lord. Let's stand. Cast out the scorner and contention shall go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. Disruptions. And just some people, man, that's, that's what they do. They just bring disruptions. They're trouble. Uh, job situations. A boss would be wise if you're dealing with somebody that's always creating turmoil in the workplace. You know, give them a chance. Talk to them. Whatever you need to do as a boss, you're wise enough to handle it. But at some point, you're going to have to look and say, you know, you need to go on because you're disrupting the whole team. And we can't get anything done until you go on. And then when they leave, it's amazing just how much peace and tranquility will be there and, and how much can get done once that's gone. Say amen. All right. God bless you. Let's pray. Father, we come before you right now. We ask your blessing to be upon the reading 